Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so last time we were talking Meldrum Thompson. This is Meldrum Thompson again. But I wanted to show you this image I completely forgot. So look what I got here. I've got a painting that I did out in Colorado. And you can see it's done with exactly the same kinds of marks, the same attention to whatever he's dealing with, major masses and the leading edges and all that sort of stuff. But it gives you some idea. Let's see if I can get it in really good light. Somewhere in here. Probably is pretty good light. And um, probably a pretty good focus, too. So, um, but that gets you some idea. I want you to see that. And I'll show it. Uh, I'll hold it up here for a few seconds uh, as we put up a couple of, uh, one of, at least one of Thompson's, I'm sorry, <laughs> one of Meldrum's and one of one of his students, all right? That guy, Le Leeson, probably. Okay. There you go. All right. Um, but this way of working actually is very, um, it, I, I guess you'd say it's very predictable. The content, visual content is visual content and it doesn't change what you do with it afterwards. And that's what I was talking about last time when I was showing their work, you know, this, this, this sort of failure to extend the magic, to, deep, to dig deeper and find more, more, more astonishing stuff. Really, the stuff that defines aesthetic, you know. Thompson is doing everything to define truth, but the word aesthetic is actually in a somewhat different place. And, uh, but it has everything to do with beauty. And by the way, one of the quotes, I'm, I'm going to read you a few quotes today from out of his stuff because they so parallel what, I, what I've taught over, the, over these years. And so parallel this thing I've phrased, the visual order, which I, I would have told you I originated. I certainly think I originated in relation to what we're doing, but I, it's specifically in relation to what I'm doing. But, but uh, and what I found in the, uh, in the Boston school, but um, this way of painting, uh, that um, that Meldrum's doing is very much based on truth and truthful relation is purely visual truth, right? And as I said before, it can often look very intellectualized, formulaic, even whatever, but I mean, it strikes you as true. It's just sort of, sort of in significant part, seems to miss the boat, or the reason for making a picture, which is a big miss, if you'd say, <laughs> if you agree. Anyway, one of the quotes I found in his book is about beauty, and he says, uh, the, um, he, says, he says, the beauty is in nature, the art is in the craft. Well, the fact is, the beauty may be in nature, but it, the beauty, some beauty, <laughs> better darn well be in your picture if you want to call yourself, if you, want to, if you want to come up, if you want to be participating in that very idea of producing an aesthetic product. I mean, what is that then, you know, if you aren't doing that? So, you could say that Gamowitz at one point said to me, he said, you know, all you, you set up a setup and all, you, you just make it as like as you possibly can. If it's a beautiful setup, you have a beautiful painting. Well, it almost, you know, that's almost true. <laughs> but it isn't precisely true. And the truth is actually um, uh, much like what I was saying last week, too, or whatever the last time we talked about Tom. But uh, I got to quit saying Meldrum. Meldrum Thompson was a governor of New Hampshire <laughs> when I first arrived here. And uh, I rather fancied the guy liked this way of, of uh, governing. But um, uh, anyway, uh, so I'll start to try to get back onto the Meldrum. I should just maybe use Max instead, shouldn't I? But so, but this question of beauty is a pretty significant one. And uh, so he makes another quote in Mother's Statement. He says, what we feel as beauty of sound was felt by human beings long before Beethoven or Bach existed. And harmonious arrangements of light phenomena were experienced by many before Velasquez and Constable. All that these men could do was discover through patient work and, um, and thought the laws governing their particular media of expression, endeavor to understand them and get in rhythm with them reverently and humbly. Now that I totally agree with. The patient observation of natural phenomena and the knowledge of the evolution of ocular science makes it possible at last to define the cause of harmonious color contrast, which up to the present has appeared an insoluble mystery. Uh, yeah, and so it's interesting that he would say that and then imply that there's no such thing as constant uh, composition. He just described what composition is, which is this you know, basically harmony, right? So if, uh, if you can do that, then you're on to something. Nevertheless, okay, so that's that part. Uh, so I suggest to you that when you look at that video, and I think it was, I forget, it was number 74. might have been just the previous one to this one. Uh, Look through, look it over, think it through with me. I did miss on one of those videos talking about uh, the Benson, uh, Benson. That's that one video in there was about spotting. Um, uh, I'll put those three up on the screen now too. The, the you know showing the Meldrum Thompson, the, the Meldrum, and, and this idea. That the one beauty of that painting is is the spots. And but I show you two other paintings with people using spots 
and making more beautiful pictures. So it's not the point is not to pick on on Meldrum as much as to simply say that you can intellectualize this all you want and you can paint from certainty that your relationships are right. But the making of beauty, the, ma the manufacturing of harmony and all that sort of stuff is not just simply a product of, of tracing nature. It's a product of understanding what you're seeing happen. And that's where I start talking about the relationships of things. And uh, so among other things, I, I drag up this idea that it's not so much what a thing is as a color note as much, as much as what it does in relation to others. For example, reds to reds, or, or uh, you know, as Degas said, you know, the most beautiful thing, one of the most beautiful things is uh, two different values of the same color side by side. He's talking about the things that actually, once you put them together, there's a doing thing that goes on that makes that a special thing. And uh, so, yeah, so keep in mind that I, there's a, something about the mechanics, if you want to call it that, of the, uh, of the Meldrum process. Uh, and what you can see in his, his students' work as well, that suggests that they believe they've accomplished something by, get, by being mechanically sound in the relationships of notes for their own sake. And uh, you know, like, as I said, a purely mechanical process. And, but it shows. It shows that there's something missing. That's why the comparison between them and the Boston School. I think the Boston School is enormously elevated compared to what they do aesthetically. So you figure out what that is. Um, okay, so... Let's start with this interesting conversation that, that uh, Da Vinci has about painting. He says, painting is concerned with all the ten attributes of sight. And he was that guy who would always classify or, or itemize the points, right? Um, for example, like saying, here's, here's, here, this part's shadow, and that part is light, the form is in the lights, you know, or the, the middle tones, you know, the sfumato, you know, and describing, you know, itemizing these things and talking about them. So, but he says there are 10 things, and, and you can agree or you can use variations within this. Uh, uh, Meldrum believes that there are, some of these can, can be synchronized. I think that sometimes Meldrum's uh, uh, can be too. Some of the things he's broken, separated, uh, can stay together. But, um, so he, but he talks about so, so 10 attributes of sight, namely darkness, brightness, substance, and color, I don't truly know what he means by substance, not know, and I'd have to look it up, uh, the Italian, whatever. Form and place, so that's the roundness of a thing or the place in relation to other, some other thing or some other phenomenon. In our case, we're talking visual phenomenon. Uh, remoteness and nearness, okay? Some things appear closer and some things further away. Um, and we even visually, some things appear closer that aren't closer. In other words, they come to your eye sooner. So that's a, still a phenomena, even though it's a variation on what the way he's talking about it. And then movement and rest. And it will, uh, and it is with these attributes that my small book will be interwoven. And I assume there's notes on painting is what he meant by a small book. So, um, but so let's just read some Meldrum quotes, and you can just follow with me, okay? Since we know that the work of the painter is two dimensional, it follows that any part of nature viewed through a frame can, by an effort of the imagination, suggest itself as a flat surface covered by patches of tone, form, and colors. And so far, and you've got to be able to do that, okay? You've got to be able to have that much imagination. And so far as you can do this, you will find it easier to speak to yourself about the three objective factors which it contains. And of course, we're talking about, as he, as he said, forms, uh, val values, forms, and colors. Uh, Inversely, it will also help you to try to imagine your picture as an actual piece of nature. And so one of the things I try to do is absolutely using this idea of reducing the seen world to two-dimensional phenomenon, seeing it as only two-dimensional. So anytime there's an angle, it never goes in. It only goes sideways, up or down, right? And all the widths are just not real widths. They're just visual widths. To, and they're, and they're me measured in relation to heights. So if you understand that, you're in pretty good shape. But the other part of what we do, when I put down the visual order, when I put down the value relationships and include the effect at key points, I get a three-dimensional world that's quite phenomenal. And I and immediately am, 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 am uh, aware of when things are screwy when, because that world is now a one-to-one -one feeling of, one, of, of 3D to 3D. And yet I'm only working with 2D and 2D, you know, and it's only value edge, et cetera. That's, that's the key to this you know, this, you know, the assessment of the visual world. That's all that could be said to be a summary statement. So that's a, that's really good. And that's exactly where I'm trying to say he and I are right on the same page in the same wavelength. 
But then he starts actually talking about things. I'm calling these visual order. So watch, watch what comes next. So the methods of the painter may be explained very simply. He disposes of paint in its tonal, formal, and chromatic qualities in such a way that these factors excite the identical stimuli, which is I received from the actual subject matter in nature. And that's why I say it's what it is, it's what it's doing, right? And um, uh, so the relative projectivity of high contrast areas over low contrast areas is an activity. It's a, it's a thing that it's doing, right? And um, there's all kinds of play in pictures like that. So, but he's saying, so, but all you have to work with is tone, uh, form, and the form is really everything spatial. And then, um, like where something lands in relation to something else, or how big it is in relation to something else. And then the chromatic, which is the color portion. So that's, but that literally is, is the, um, uh, the stimuli with which is I, re which is I receive from the actual subject matter in nature. So if something happens, you look at something and you see something, you feel something happening, your job is to put data down until the same thing is happening, whatever it is. So effects of light is one of those classes, you know, the effect of light and effect of light, um, but various kinds of play of that, of that sort. Okay, so I call that, that's very fundamental to what I call visual order. Now visual order part two, there's three parts I've broken up. Uh, so the second one is a painted canvas, a quote from Meldrum again, a painted canvas reflects reality insofar as it conducts the eye in the same directions and at the same speeds that's conducted in the actual subject matter. It's fatal to, to dictate to the eye. And it's fatal to truth, right? Try to relax and let it go where it wants to. Be you, the obedient little dog. Let it be the master. And that's what I've been saying all along, right? I learned to, to, to paint when I learned to be quiet and listen, when I learned to become a meditator. And just say, oh, you mean like this, and try this to that, and this to that, and say, oh, yeah, I, oh, no, this should be a little more, I see what you mean, yeah. And you're just talking to nature, <laughs> you know, your canvas is, your, your, your statement here on the canvas is, is reflecting nature. Uh, and we're talking visual now, we're not talking about drawing noses and faces, okay? And again, I, I repeat, the key to everything <laughs> about drawing faces and noses is in the visual phenomena. That's all we have with our eyes, for our eyes to pick up, and, the, and being fully objective about where they are, how big they are, and all that sort of stuff, as abstract functions, you know what I mean, as elements, as visual elements, is always, it's really what you must be skilled at, right? Otherwise, I'd suggest to you, you have no legs under you. And I've been saying that before, so. All right, so then we come to uh, the last one. And I, there may be one other, was there one other thought in here before I say that's the last one? Um, so, there's a thought of my own, but let me just say visual order. So he says the, the ability to, to deal with ocular facts in the order of perception is practically the whole difficulty of the painter. Okay. In the order of perception, that's what I call visual order. The order in which they come to your eye, you know, that's what the blurring of the eye, the squinting and all that stuff is all about. You're blurring your eyes, see who's first. And then you, main, you set up a visual order, you set up the strong guys, and you, and you play the order, right? So, uh, yeah, and so the whole difficulty of the painter, it's only acquired after years of study and demonstration with the brush in hand. So you have to teach yourself with your brush. You have to teach your muscles to, to do this way. Uh, by the way, this is another beauty quote. Uh, it was said by Sir Thomas Lawrence that we can never hope to compete with nature in the beauty and delicacy of her separate forms or colors, our only chance is in selection and combination. So he's saying that the beauty that we, he's, say, he's saying that the essential beauty in a painting is relational. It's the way things play to each other and, and they, they create their own, they, they create that sort of beauty. I wouldn't tell you it's their own beauty, it's the beauty even that is found in nature. But since we can't paint the sun with the yolk of an egg, we're not discussing that. We're discussing what happens between notes to make it appear to be doing something that magical. Okay. All right. So almost at the end of this one. Um, and the, um, so then I have, I make this point eventually. Uh, I just repeat it here, but I'm going to put it down as a quote. Um, and, and I'm going to repeat this just because you've, you heard it at the beginning. But what appears to be happening at, in Thompson's other work is, Yes, they get relationships right of all kinds and all that sort of stuff. 
but there seems to be some uh, unwillingness to deal with uh, sort of more profound levels of what's up, you know, and, and deeper discussions of the music. And that's where I think it's probably because, because Thompson is a, is, is, is a scholar, he's a scientist, he's an intellectual, he's doing what he does to prove certain things scientific, shall we say. Where, um, uh, and that's not unusual, by the way, to find a painter who's really good, as it were, scientifically, and the guy following him be a greater artist, you know, actually putting that stuff to use. But, um, but I'm, I'm suggesting this one last idea, and that is that the mindless assortment, adjustment of color spots without understanding what sensation they create is an abdication of responsibility. And he actually, that's what he was implying there. They're doing something. They're giving you a sensation. And, but I'm suggesting that beauty and truth are, are inextricable. Beauty and truth are. And beauty is a product of the combination of visual fact data. Okay, it's not simply an isolated pretty note. And that's, I'm just now, it sounds like I'm just quoting uh, Lawrence. But, but uh, I'm not sure how Meldrum feels about beauty, but there are several other, I've already given you the quotes I have. So, uh, as I said, the, the, the stuff I showed you last week shows these dip, deeper, richer explorations of beauty by, by Sargent, by, 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 um, by even uh, Gertrude Fisk, an American painter, and by, um, and by um, uh, Monet. And then the Boston School guys. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Uh, that's my attempt to give him credit where credit's due. Um, and, um, and I hope that uh, sort of satisfies the question that Jazz was asking, which is just for me to give a sense of, you know, having observed Meldrum's words as best I can and, um, and, then, um, and then looked at his paintings. The, only, the last thing I'm going to say, this is this getting long yet? It's not getting short. <laughs> the last thing I want to say, though, is I had a phone call today from someone who uh, has a connection to the connection, so uh, to Meldrum. Uh, I once was on the way to the Rodin Museum, by the way, and, and somebody picked me up as a hitchhiker. And this guy picked me up, and he said, where are you headed? Oh, I'm going to the, to the Rodin show, and, uh, you know, that, that museum they have their collection. And he says, oh, well, you want to shake my hands then? I said, oh, yeah. And he said, yeah, this, you shake the hands of a guy who's shaking the hands of Rodin. <laughs> I feel like the guy I was talking to today is just like that. This this gentleman knows somebody, two, a couple different guys in the Chicago area, and uh, who 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 um, themselves brought, uh, as I take it, they brought uh, Meldrum over to do some of his lectures in the Chicago area, and then kept him around for a few months. And um, but uh, they, uh, but the uh, so that area actually has a number of people who work that way. I don't know what influence it actually ultimately had on the um, work in Chicago of anybody or anything, but uh, one of the guys, this guy Percy Leeson, um, came out of Australia having studied with uh, Meldrum and then worked the rest of his life, took his family and all, and worked the rest of his life in the Chicago area. So it's, all, it's there and it's a bigger world and it's very nice. I appreciate when people give me that extra information. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dominic. All right, uh, thank you. See you next time. Uh, uh, share, um, uh, like, subscribe, all the rest. Uh, you're doing great. And uh, I hope you continue to get some little gem from time to time out of these. Thank you very much.